Absolutely thrilled to be in Houston to be speaking with Chris, who I have incredible admiration for. And thank you all so much for coming out and taking some time to listen uh, about the New Orleans story. I'm going to talk a lot about the system we've built in New Orleans and the principles behind it, the results we've gotten. But I want to start with a quick story that really, I hope, sets the context for where we were before Hurricane Katrina. Um, at the time, uh, around 2004, 2005, there was a woman named Bridget Green who attended Alice Forche High School. It was a middle performing high school in New Orleans, surely wasn't one of the worst. Um, during that time, and you all might have something similar here in Texas, there was a high school exit exam. It covered roughly through 10th grade uh, Algebra 1 Geometry. And you had to pass that exam to graduate from high school. And you could start taking it in the 10th grade. So Bridget, the first time she took it in 10th grade, she failed the math section. She then went on and took Algebra 2, got an A, took Pre-Calc, got an A. Her senior year, she had at this time failed the same test three times in a row. So she goes to her guidance counselor and asks if she can drop Jim to take a remedial math class. And her guidance counselor rejects her request. She takes the 10th grade exam again, this time as a senior, and fails it for the fourth time. She then takes the ACT, and she scores an 11. This put Bridget in the bottom 1% of test takers in the nation. At the time she scored an 11, Bridget happened to be the valedictorian of her high school. She was ranked number one in her class, was by all accounts considered the brightest student in the school. She ended up not being able to walk across the stage her senior year because she never passed the 10th grade test on time. So that's where we were in New Orleans before the storm. The valedictorian of the New Orleans high school was scoring in the bottom 1% nationally and couldn't pass a state exam that covered 10th grade material. And there were thousands of others of Bridget Greens in New Orleans. And to be blunt, they were getting screwed by adults. They were being told they were on track. They were being told they were college ready. When any time they took an objective test of their knowledge, they were failing miserably through no fault of their own. Then Hurricane Katrina hits, and I want to take a quick note to thank you all so much for what the city of Houston did for New Orleans evacuees and still continues to do for folks who I know have settled permanently here. Uh, an immense amount of gratitude for you all opening up your arms. But for New Orleans, 2,000 New Orleanians died. It was our nation's worst natural disaster in our country's history, over 80% of the buildings underwater. Um, I'm not sure if you all have heard Secretary Duncan, the uh, head of education for the federal government, got in some trouble for saying Hurricane Katrina was the best thing ever to happen to New Orleans education. Uh, and this is, this is worth noting. In some sense, it did give us an opportunity to rebuild, and I'll talk about what we did with that opportunity. On the other hand, our children went through what no children should ever have to go to. And the kids we serve, the most at risk, their families were dislocated all over the country. If you visit New Orleans schools now, the principals will talk about the post-traumatic stress that still haunts these children's lives. So the fact that we've achieved what we've achieved despite Hurricane Katrina, in our minds, is a testament to human resilience more than any opportunity that was given to us by a natural disaster. But we did have an opportunity to rethink public education in our city. So this is a very, very juvenile uh, uh, picture of what we ended up seeing. You know, we looked around the country, we, we had a chance to rebuild, and we wanted to say, who should we replicate? Um, who's doing it right? And it won't shock you all, the folks in this room, to know what we ended up knowing. That there's not one urban city in this country, one of the wealthiest countries in the world, that is serving students, and specifically average students, at the level they deserve to be served, which in our minds is just a complete national tragedy. And we wanted to figure out why. How could we make sure we didn't replicate the same mistakes as everybody else? And what we quickly found is that we just had a ton of empathy for everybody working in the system. And I'll talk about two sides really quickly. You know, a lot of folks bash the union. Um, when you think about what it means to be a member of the union on an individual teacher level, if you're an individual teacher in an urban school district, you have two realities that you're going to face. The first is in most cities, there's one employer, it's one public monopoly over education. 
So if you ever get fired in that city, you're probably not going to be able to work in the public sector doing the job you love. The second reality you know, and which you all know, is that most urban school districts aren't run particularly well. There's a lot of bad apples. There's a lot of principals who probably aren't going to cut it for kids. And so you know if you're teaching for 30 to 40 years, you might be managed by a weak principal at some point. So if that's your reality, you know if you get fired, you never get to work again in the city, and you don't trust the people who are going to be managing you, it doesn't shock me that unions have gone to job protection, given the situation they find themselves in. On the other side of the spectrum, uh, the folks who don't like reform bash charter schools and, and the great work folks like Chris have done. And they say charter schools are boutique. You know, they serve 2%, 3%. If you're really serious about reform, you know, you can't be serious about charter schools. Well, when you take life from a charter school leader's perspective, your realities are this. Most districts won't give you free facilities. On average, nationally, charters get 80% of the funds as traditional schools, so they're taking a 20% off the top. Uh, <laughs> most superintendents are trying to kind of kill you by a death by a thousand paper cuts and use whatever political influence they have to keep you from growing. And then if you try to cross state lines, the regulations across states are very different and very complicated. As a country, we do not have an educational system that is built for charters to scale. So to say that it's the charter's fault they haven't been able to scale, I think, is to totally miss the issue. It's the system we've built. So this was our big takeaway, that if you try to reform unions, curriculum, assessment, charters, what have you, in 20 years, we're going to be having the exact same conversation, and we're going to be talking about other Bridget Greens who've been failed by the system. Our biggest takeaway was if we were going to have change, we needed to transform the system itself. And I'll talk a little bit about how we did that. The quick takeaway is we broke the district apart. Currently in New Orleans, 85% of students attend charter schools. We're on our way in three to four years to that being 100%. We're going to be the nation's first charter school district. Really quickly on the results we've achieved to date before we talk about the model itself. Uh, this chart here looks at all students' proficiency levels from 2000 to 2011. You'll see in 2000, New Orleans was at a dismal 25% proficiency as a city. The state, the top line, was at 51%. Uh, a lot of folks who are critics of what's happened in New Orleans will talk about how things were getting better before the storm. And you'll see from 2000 to 2005, New Orleans went from 25 to 35% proficiency. You can also see on the top, the state went from 51 to 58. Um, we get very nervous whenever a city is just tracking the state, because states make their tests easier all the time. So if those lines are moving at about parallel, we're not really sure if we're actually improving a lot of the states moving at the same level. And then you'll see what happened from 2005 to 2011. And keep in mind, the state had six years, and we only had five in New Orleans because of Hurricane Katrina. We've cut the gap between New Orleans and the state by over 56%. We're now up to 56% proficiency, the state at 66%. We're fairly confident that within five years, New Orleans is going to be the first urban center in our country's recent history that's high poverty to surpass its state average. We think within about five years, we're going to beat Louisiana. But to put that in context, Louisiana is the 49th lowest performing state in our country. So what does it mean for us uh, in, in education in New Orleans if we're preparing our children to be marginally better of the bottom of our country, not even to speak about being competitive globally? We have a long, long way to go. Another quick uh, data chart here. If you would take Louisiana's current accountability system and map that back onto New Orleans in 2005, 78% of New Orleans students would have been attending failing schools. Four out of every five students attending a school that you would never dare send your child to. Within five years, we've got that down to 40%. And we're highly, highly confident within five more years, we're going to get that down to 5%. So in a 10-year period, we're going to move from 80% of students attending failing schools to 5%. If we can pull this off, it'll likely be the greatest turnaround our nation's seen in terms of reducing the number of students attending failing schools. But again, being marginally above failing is not what we're in this for. Uh, when we tell the New Orleans story in layman's terms, we often talk about having gone from F to C. 
we were perhaps the worst school district in the country, and at best, we've stabilized it. Um, we're no better than mediocre right now. And the fight we're fighting right now is can we be the first district to get to A? But as this data shows, we have a long, long way to go. Um, when you all are thinking about the New Orleans model, and, and if we talk a little deeper about it, I would just ask you to keep one question in your head. And the question is perhaps the most important question facing business leaders, education leaders in our country. And the question is this, it's when you get in power, what are you gonna do with that power? And we're seeing an interesting trend happening. And, you know, for those of you who follow Teach for America, Teach for America started as kind of the renegade group that you know, infiltrated districts. Uh, funny things happened over the past 20 years. The Teach for America alums are now running school districts, and Chris is a great example. And even amongst these groups, we're seeing two very different things happening. So the superintendents of DC and Newark are Teach for America alums. And what happened with them, and they're brilliant, brilliant people, is they've taken the mentality, and I deeply understand it, that I've been successful all my life. I've busted bureaucracies. Every time somebody told me I couldn't do it, I got it done. <coughs> and I'm gonna do this the same way. Now that I have the power, now that I'm the superintendent, I am gonna make this system better. And then you have another set of superintendents who are coming up through the system. Uh, in my mind, unfortunately, there's only a couple. Chris is one, a guy named John White who runs our state uh, education office, our local superintendent, a guy named Patrick Dobar. And they've done something fundamentally different. They have gotten into power, and then what they've said is my job is slowly, prudently, and surely to hand power back to educators, to let educators run their own schools, and to let parents choose where to go to their schools. And it's a very, very different way of leading, um, and it's something that deserves to be watched, and Chris is gonna talk a little more about how he's trying to replicate that and lead in this fashion. But the question of, are you gonna reform the current system, or are you gonna relinquish power back to educators and parents, is perhaps the most pressing question we have as a country in determining our education future. Um, we've tried really hard to boil down the New Orleans system into a couple different principles. We know governance is different everywhere. Some people have mayoral control, some people have elected school boards. So we said forget about all that for now. If you want to think about the, system, the principles we believe in, we think they're applicable in the numerous environments. I'm going to run through them really quickly. Five key principles of the New Orleans model. Principle number one is perhaps uh, the most significant departure from other systems. It's the role of government. Increasingly in New Orleans, the government doesn't hire teachers, it doesn't set curriculum, it doesn't determine the length of the school day. All those decisions are made by nonprofit organizations who are running schools. The role of the government has shifted to become an accountability agent. So they're much more aligned with you know, the FCC or the SEC or the EPA. They set the rules of the system they then, for lack of a better word, give out licenses to nonprofits to actually do the work of running schools. And then they make sure those nonprofits are playing by the rules. And that, that last part's really, really important, and it's something we didn't do very well at the beginning. No individual charter school can make sure that the charter school down the road is actually serving all kids, is doing their enrollment right, is really serving special education students at the level they need to be served. That can't be a charter charter responsibility. That's fundamentally a government responsibility. And so the government in New Orleans now, they actually put out equity reports on every charter school in the system that publicly lists retention data, enrollment data, percentage of students with special ed, uh, expulsion data. And the government tracks that, and if charters aren't playing by the rules, they'll shut you down. Same way for legal compliance, um, same way for financial compliance. So the role of government's inc extremely important. They get to determine who opens schools, they close schools, and they make sure people are playing by the rules. But they do not operate schools anymore in New Orleans, and we're really the first city to try this new model. The second principle is the expansion of great schools, and really this is the expansion of great educator talent. Um, often in systems, I've heard stories where somebody tells me, you know, <clears throat> I was doing incredible work at a school, but somebody had promoted the gym teacher to principal 40 years ago and I, and I can get nowhere. And then maybe, you know, when, I, when I'm 50, I finally get promoted to principal 
and then I get yanked into the central office when I'm 53, and I've just lost part of my career not being able to serve kids at the level I've wanted. In New Orleans, it's different. Um, if you're a great teacher, we'll either encourage you to stay in the, in the classroom, which is an unbelievable service, or you'll quickly move to become an assistant principal. By, you know, uh, within the five to ten years, you'll likely become a principal. And if you do that really well, a group like ours will say, well, why don't you open your own school? Um, why don't, if you have an educational vision, you should run with that vision. You should run your own organization, and you should build a team around that. And then if that one school does really well, a group like ours will come back with some more money and say, can you do two schools, and can you do three schools? And instead of having to move up a bureaucracy where you didn't hire the other people you're now managing, those leaders can groom people, and those people can open up school number two and school number three. So our great educators get to stay close to kids, they get to expand their reach through entrepreneurial growth, and they get to do it in a coherent way that's true to the mission, values, and philosophies that they've built. So our educators just get a ton of opportunity to serve kids very, very quickly. The opposite side of this is what happens when a school isn't hitting its marks. This has been an Achilles heel of the charter school movement. Uh, the church school movement was founded on the idea that if you give us autonomy, you can then hold us accountable. And if we don't get results, you can close us down. I think it's been extremely unfortunate that what's happened across the country is when charter schools don't get results, they start making excuses. And they say, give us one more year, give us two more years. And they're really, they're breaking the bargain that I think they made with the public and the taxpayers. Um, we do not want this to happen in New Orleans. Charter schools, on average, are a pretty mixed bunch across the country. We want our system to be excellent. To date in New Orleans, every charter school that has not hit its mark within five years has been closed. Um, we've done that about four to five times over the past three years. But this is a big worry for us. Um, it takes a lot of courage. Uh, it takes a lot of political will to make that decision. And this is a major threat to our system. The day we don't take this seriously, where the bargain we're making with educators that they have to get results, the day our system will start falling apart. Principle number four is families have choice. Uh, this for us more than anything is just a straight moral from the heart principle. We find it very troubling that in this country, a family can choose where to go to the grocery store, where to go to the drugstore, where to get their hair cut. But perhaps the most important decision they're going to make in their family's life, where to send their child to school, we say based on what block you live on, the government's going to assign you to go somewhere. Um, and note that this doesn't happen to wealthy people. Wealthy people have a ton of choices. They just get outside of the government system or they use their influence to get into the government school they want. But the families that probably need an unbelievable education the most, we assign them. And we say, we know better than what you know, family, about where to send your kid to school. We think that's fundamentally wrong. We think families know their children the best, and that they should have an array of options that are actually different, and different kids are going to thrive in different types of environments. And so we give families choice, and any New Orleans parent can send their kid to any school in the city, and we provide free transportation for them to do so. The last principle here, and to be honest, this one really took me by surprise. I, di I didn't expect how big of a deal this was going to be. It's giving educators choice. When we talk about choice, we often talk about parents having choice. I would argue in some ways New Orleans is one of the best places in the country to teach because you've got to pick where to teach. There's about 35 different nonprofits running schools across the city. You can find a leader you admire, uh, an academic philosophy you admire, a team you admire, and you can join that organization. Uh, a really quick story, I had a conversation that really moved me on this piece a couple months ago. January through April is the time uh, when recruitment happens in New Orleans. And I was talking to a teacher and she was telling me what it felt like to get a phone call and an email every day from other charter schools begging her to come work at that school. Word had gotten out that she was an incredible teacher. She very clearly said, she said, you know, money's important and Lord knows I'd like more money. But in terms of changing my identity and making me feel valued, nothing's ever made me feel this valued to know that other people would do anything they can to get me into their building because I'm that good. Uh, so the idea of professionalizing the teaching profession by giving them options and giving them choice and it's fascinating what happens when you're a school, and, and I'm sure Chris could tell you about this, 
When you know your teachers can leave and they have other places they can work, you have to retain them through treating them well, through growing them, not through a contract. Uh, and that's a very different relationship. And so our hope is the idea of educators in schools actually having choice and people moving around is going to do a ton to increase development, increase retention, and really make teaching the professional uh, profession that we all know it is. So those are the five principles. Um, government gets out of the game of directly running schools. It's an accountability agent. Great schools expand. Failing schools close. Families have choice. Educators have choice. We're just a couple of years into this. Uh, no doubt there's more principles that we haven't figured out, but in our short experience, these are the things that have risen to the top for us. Uh, a lot of folks, when uh, we're talking about New Orleans, very quickly go to the idea that, well, you all had a hurricane. Um, you know, this is completely different than our context. This really can't happen here. And uh, on some level, it's true. The, the experience we went through, for all its harm and its benefits, it, it was extremely unique in our country's history. And I totally acknowledge that. And I don't think any city is going to take the exact same path we've taken. I think the work Chris is doing in Memphis that he'll talk about actually illustrates another path to get to the same goals and incredibly excited to watch him do his work. Uh, so we've tried to think about, and I've just tried to put myself in other people's shoes, you know, what would I do if I was the superintendent of Houston or Spring Branch or another city across the country, you know, it'd probably be a, a fundamentally different experience. And uh, we came up with uh, one simple rule that it's not an iron rule by any means, but we hope it's at the very least illustrative. And we, and we call it the 5% rule. And it's very simple. Um, New Orleans went to 50% charter in about three years. We think that pace was more uh, a cause of our circumstances than any great strategic planning. I'm not sure other cities should follow the same pace to the extent that they want to um, try to go down this road. We've looked at cities across the country, and we think on average, a city could charter about 5% of its system a year. Um, again, this is not an iron rule, uh, but we've looked at cities large and small, and the numbers kind of work. And the numbers are also vary to see where this heads. If you do this for five years, and let's assume a baseline of 10% charter, most urban districts are around that now. In five years, you'd be 35% charter. In another five years, you'd be 60% charter. Very quickly after that, 70% charter. In roughly a 10 to 15 year period, you could transform your urban school system. And I know people look for quick fixes, but if you would go to the reforms people started 20 years ago and say, are you happy with where you've gotten in 20 years? I think most cities would say no. Um, so this idea of can you get a coherent strategy can you stick with it and can you slowly do the right thing and hand power back to educators and parents? We think most cities can do that at about 5% a year. Um, but well, let me give you the numbers and, and you can tell me if I'm full of it or not. Uh, so here's four cities and we threw up some local ones. Um, Indianapolis, Spring Branch, Memphis, and Houston. Um, estimated number of schools, 60, 45, 209, 279. So you go from kind of small urban areas to Houston, which I think is one of the top five in the country, give or take. So what would it mean if these cities tried to do the 5% rule and grow their charter market at 5% a year? Indianapolis would have to open up three schools. Spring Branch, two schools. Memphis, 10 schools. And Houston, 14 schools. Um, so let's go the biggest and start with Houston. Um, 14 schools a year. There is no reason that Houston, with all its philanthropy, all its leadership, the incredible talent you have here, if you devoted your energy, that you could not open 14 charter schools a year. I think Yes and KIPP could do the bulk of that in any given year, and no doubt you could create other great organizations and grow them as well. So this, in our mind, you know, I don't, I don't know what makes sense in Houston. You guys know it better than I do. Just want to paint a picture that this is possible that if you do ever decide to go this route, you don't have to do it all at once. You need to grow 14 charter schools a year over roughly a five to 10 year period to transform Houston's educational system. And from an outsider's perspective, I really deeply believe that you all can do that. <coughs> uh, so I'm gonna end here. Um, 
and, and Chris is going to talk about this a little bit as well and place this in a national context. Uh, we've seen what a teacher can do. We've seen what a school can do. Yes has proven what a network of schools can do. The moment we're at now in our country's educational history is can a district do it? Can a whole city do it? Because until that happens, people are always going to point to the examples and say, you know, that's boutique reform. That's not systematic. And basically what those people often mean not all of them, but you've heard it enough. They'll talk about phrases like these kids, those kids, and it's code. And it's code for the fact that they don't believe that poor and minority kids can learn. They do not think that poor and minority kids can go to college and achieve and compete with their wealthier white peers. And until one city gets this done, that myth is never going to get busted. We are working blood, sweat, and tears to make New Orleans that first city. If we don't do it, I hope it's Houston. If Houston can't do it, I hope it's Memphis. But that's really the national challenge we have in front of us. Uh, New Orleans is nowhere there yet. You know, we're at a C at best. I hope you all watch us. And again, if we don't do it, I surely hope you all do. Thank you so much.